Uh, good evening, ladies and gents, wherever you may be around the world, and welcome to this special stream. I am greatly honored this evening to have, ladies and gents, wherever you may be around the world, and welcome to this special stream. I am greatly honored this evening to have. If I didn't do that at least once on every stream, I'd get attacked, I think. Um, anyway, I'm greatly honored this evening to have two excellent guests in the shape of Nathan C.J. Hood and Rupert August. Um, and we're going to be talking about the English yeoman and his place in history and legend. Um, Nathan, how are you doing, mate? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be here for such a, a rich topic. Uh, thank you for having me on. Very welcome. Rupert, how are you going, mate? Yeah, doing well. Uh, thanks for having me on again. Always good to talk about some history. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, English history is such a rich subject. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, um, all right. Um, what, I'd, I'd like to ask you guys before we start what you think about when you hear the phrase English German. Um, Nathan, what, what, what's your thinking on that one? I think as a, an, a kind of initial impression, and it would probably be somewhat romanticized, uh, probably informed by kind of neo medievalism in the Victorian era, is the kind of down to earth. Um, a woodsman or forester of some kind who uh, is deeply connected with the land, who um, is has martial prowess, will be able to use a bow and arrow, for example, uh, may, and is often in the service, uh, freely in the service of a, a king or a noble of some kind in battle. And so this is quite um, a uh, powerful image or archetype uh, and I guess one of the things we'll be looking at is how uh, how much of that is inspired by history, how much of it is a bit more complicated. But to me, that's that's kind of the spirit of the omen uh, that's often invoked in uh, literature of various kinds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, uh, Rupert, what, what, what was your thinking on that? Just as an overview. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that we generally uh, tend to think about it, I, I would think, based on sort of what I've come to understand, is um, someone that's basically higher than what you what you typically class as a peasant uh, and lower than what you typically class as a knight. I mean, uh, the complicating factor is that a lot of these um, categories can be a little bit uh, fuzzy, fuzzy at times, um, especially with peasant, because I believe peasant basically just refers to anyone who is in the countryside. So strictly speaking, you would say a yeoman is a peasant. But you know, not not usually what you'd think about when somebody says the word peasant. So yeah, basically just somebody who's who, who's uh, doing fairly well for themselves, um, but still, you know, lives a very rural rural uh, agrarian life. Uh, so far as I understand it, um, a yeoman would be a guy who is above the peasant class, but slightly below the gentry class but would get their hands dirty in the sense of they would actually work on their farm. Like I said, I think the actual etymology of the word peasant, I believe, comes from French, which, which is uh, essentially just pointing to more or less anyone in the countryside. So if you wanted to be a little bit more precise, then you would talk about um, the idea of someone who's a serf of some kind, um, you know, covering all, all different manners of um, uh, bondage that existed between, you know, villains, um, serfs, slaves. Uh, I don't think serf was its own category in the in the English context, but yes, um, slaves, cottagers, thralls. You know, all, all these all these come with uh, various like legal uh, implications, rights, and uh, and privileges, and like uh, and you know different elements of, of status and like what what they could expect uh, in terms of their relationship with their with their relevant lord. Um, and they're def the, the yeoman is definitely not one of those. So he's, he's more in the free man category. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. He's, he's absolutely a free man. Um, I mean, even on the thumbnail for this stream, which comes from Chaucer's Canterbury Shout Tales, 
um, the 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 um, the English omen is maybe a servant of the night, but he is a freeman. He's not a serf. Like if he chooses to be the servant of the night, he is that. Dude. Well, there, there were often still expectations around that. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure they were, for sure they were. But the the English guys, um, look, I'm, I've had arguments about this on Apostolic Majesty's um, Discord, amongst other places. The, um, the one of the real outstanding differences between England and later Britain and the continent was that um, the, the 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 Anglo-Saxons did not really have serfs yes they had thralls who to some degree were slaves but um that's a complicated subject all right and this is um, a linguistic question as much as anything else because yeah, yeah because yeah, serfdom yeah. serfdom is strictly speaking a category yeah and and you could get out of it just like ancient roman slavery it was perfectly possible to be a thrall and later on get out of it and become a warrior or whatever. It was always possible to do that. Um, whereas England, but England didn't have serfs. Um, so 1066 and William the Bastard wins his battle, sadly, in my opinion, but um, he wins his battle. Um, but I don't think that feudalism and serfdom really, really went very deep in England because as soon as the 1340s come around and the Black Death, um, it was it, it was destroyed like almost immediately in England by the Black Death, serfdom. Um, Whereas it wasn't in France or Germany or Austria or any of these other places on the continent where also loads of people died from the Black Death. But in England, it was destroyed immediately as far as I can work out. No, it still, it still persisted until uh, 1574 under Elizabeth I. But by that point, it, was, uh, it pretty much already died out naturally. It, it, all right, it existed like in law but effectively it died in the 1340s it really i mean i'm not i'm not i mean based on what i'm looking at what i'm looking at, at the moment apparently uh it persisted in scotland until 1775 which i can believe in the highlands especially well all right um we're talking about england i believe rather than scotland but um it, Serfdom really died out in England in the 30s. It just um, did. I mean, like, in, yeah, by, by and large, in terms of. There was no way of holding people to the land, is what I'm trying to say. Well, there was. There was the law. Which no one enforced. After I mean, yeah. It, it, it's a complicated picture, but uh, if, a, if a lord was aware that. Uh, that a serf who, who didn't have the legal right to leave at any time, which I believe some of them did, um, it just meant that they would lose their livelihood immediately, um, you know, because you would earn the right to be able to, to uh, farm a certain por portion of land uh, for your own sustenance. Um, and in return, you'd have to, you know, pay, yep. uh, pay, pay remuneration in terms of like labor and such to the Lord. Um, so you'd, you'd lose that and you'd essentially become a vagrant, but there were still ways that you could, um, you know, sustain yourself if you, if you felt up to the task. I believe that's how it worked. But if you didn't have that right and you tried to abscond to say the town, um, then if you were if you were found, if you if you were known to be there uh, by the lord, then he could just get you back. You could you could be forced forced to go back. It almost never happened. I I, I don't know about that. I, I mean, I know the the towns were quite happy to protect um, escaped serfs because uh, they they always had a, had a pretty chronic lack of. Um, Labour. Yes. Yes. I think the, one, one thing uh, I was... Go sorry. ahead, RM Duke. Go no, ahead. No, you carry on, man. Well, I, I was just going to say on the, the yeoman, uh, kind of in relation to this, one of the things that I came across 
was that they, because of their status, which was a bit higher than most um, commoners, but lower than the gentry, they often took up roles of administering the law within uh, towns, boroughs, forests, etc. So they were like your local um, wardens um, and so on. And it would really be their responsibility to administer the law in a lot of places. They were the, the police force, essentially, of that period. Um, yeah. So, and I, I think that's quite interesting because there's a, there's, a, there's a sense within that sort of society that if you have a certain amount of wealth, uh, property, and I guess with that power, then it's not just for your own benefit. It's then to bring order to society. It's to be, um, it's for the common good, as it were. Like, it, uh, I guess you've got that um, <laughs> cliche Spider-Man uh, uh, phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. And in a way, the yeoman is the first step on that ladder, and thus they have that kind of authority within medieval society. Yes, absolutely right. Well, fun, um, funny enough, though, especially late on, quite a lot of the um, the privileges that, that were associated with those positions in society were actually themselves heritable. So it is almost as though there's a there's like a separate parallel um, aristocracy that's, that's sort of formed. And especially under the Tudors, that becomes even more the case. So that's one of the things that the yeoman, um, or one of the connotations that, that yeoman has gained fairly late on in, in the grand scheme of things, that um, that they were direct servants of the crown, uh, royal, royal yeoman. So they kind of bypass the nobility then in that regard? Yeah, I mean, if, if I had to come up with my own theory as to why that was, it's, uh, it's because uh, Henry VII in particular did not have too much trust for um, the nobility of the times, you know, hot, hot off the back of the War of the Roses, which he just decisively settled in his favour. Um, he wanted to sort of have a, a more separate power base uh, purely to himself. And so this is when you get the... Um, the yeoman royal guard, the, the longbow armed, armed um, yeoman guard. Uh, and you also get various various other attendants, other types of attendants and um, and sort of bureaucrats uh, who were formerly yeoman, or well, you know, still are yeoman, um, but they're brought directly into the service of the crown. Yeah, ab absolutely. But I mean, uh, one of the things you see when you look at this is that the yeoman were one way an English king could to some degree bypass the aristocracy um, because he could get supported by these, um, how can we put it, uh, more, more, more sort of middling Englishmen, if that makes any sense. I, th I think another key point is that uh, they didn't actually have any uh, direct claim to power themselves. So it, the nearest example that comes to mind, or, or like a comparison that, that, that came to mind for me, was uh, the Equites in Rome. So they became very prominent uh, in the eras, uh, well, you know, in, in the, the two later eras of the, em of the empire, because they were, it was a way of by, by bypassing the patricians, basically, because the patricians could otherwise always have a, uh, a pretense towards trying to gain more power for themselves and uh, ruling to some degree legitimacy and uh, legitimately in their own right, whereas the equites never could. I think the same principles at play, basically. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's a reasonable um, simile. Um, the equites were, of course, what in in Rome, ancient Rome were called the knights. Um, I, I yeah, the the the, the English yeomen were, as I said at the beginning of the stream. Um, above the peasants, but they were landowners that you had to own some land. You didn't have to own a lot of land. You might be a cottager or something like that. Um, but you might own a fair amount of land. The difference between you and the gentry was you probably got your hands dirty and actually worked on your farm. Potentially, but I, I believe the main difference is just that uh, they weren't titled. So there was theoretically... If my understanding is correct, there was, there was theoretically no upper limit as to how much uh, land a uh, a yeoman could own. Um, no. he, would, he would still be a yeoman until he actually gained some kind of uh, title that elevated him to the nobility. Uh, oftentimes, they could earn they could own more than a hundred acres of land, which is you know, obviously far too much for them to be farming personally, especially if they'd, as uh, as Nathan said, taken on other social responsibilities. Um, so maybe they'd, they'd be involved in their land still, and maybe they'd still administer it in some way. But uh, it, it seems quite likely at that point that they are just a land. And that landlord sort of in their own right but 
I don't, I don't know. I, you, you may be right, Rupert, but I, I think they tended to actually work on their land still. I, I think that was one of the things about being a yeoman. You actually did some work on your land. But maybe you only did a bit, but you still work. Well, I think, I think the... For one thing, and this this might be part of the um, part of the romance. I'm not sure, or or it could just be part of the problem of having a, quite a large category to deal with that, that uh, covers a fairly wide gamut of uh, of people and and like different circumstances that existed at the time. Because I think the as you were sort of saying, the the, the lower limit for for qualifying as a yeoman was actually pretty pretty low, really. Uh, yeah. So I think it was something like six pounds uh, a year income in uh, in assets basically you, you, you need to own a cottage and a cottage garden and maybe a small hole yeah but, but bear in mind six pounds back in those days was actually quite a lot of money you well, yes yeah in terms of like peasant people yeah but if you if, you, if, you, if you're getting it down to an actual an actual number there was a fairly i believe there was a fairly fixed threshold above which you were a you were a yeoman, or you were you you could be considered a yeoman, but it does seem to have also varied a little bit by uh, by region, and so it was kind of to some extent, by the sounds of it, left down to um, you know local local customs and practices to sort of determine who who was a yeoman and who wasn't. Okay, so I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning, uh, Rupert. What what would you describe a, a yeoman as? Well. So uh, a freeholder, a freeholding, I, I would say a freeholding peasant. Um, so somebody who is who is in the yeah, countryside. A bit, peasant, a, peasant, a bit above a peasant, I'd say. Well, but... Again, I think a, pe a peasant is a is more of a generic category. It's not a, it, it's somebody in the countryside, basically. So like a rural, rural worker, like an agrarian figure. So not somebody who is a, uh, who is a townsman or, a, you know, a, a sure verger sure or enough. anything like that. Um has some amount of money um, at the minimum level, but because this is a fairly uh, wide group, like a wide descriptor, um, it could be anyone up to, uh, you know, fairly lofty local mandates, uh, ma magnates rather. But yeah. the key is simply that they are somebody who has, somebody who has, who has some fair amount of means, they own their own destiny to some, de to some degree. Um, and they don't have a title, and that, that's pretty much it. Yeah. The only thing, uh, the only, the only other things I would maybe add would be that later on it um, it com comes to be sort of associated with uh, you know a good degree of other local local uh, privileges that had come to be associated with yeomen because they've been uh, sort of you know placed on on yeomen um, over time. And I would argue that this is also because there's kind of like a, uh, a separation that takes place. So if you have, uh, you know, just this this wide population of like rural workers and like uh, people in a, in a rural environment, um, then you get a separation between the competent ones and the uh, and the less competent ones, just sort of uh, naturally due to uh, natural capabilities. And so the the ones who who really distinguish themselves and are able to you know, work hard, then they can ascend to being yeoman. But because there's still the title system in place, then uh, you know unless they they get royal favor at some point then they're not going to automatically be able to ascend to a higher to a higher position just by merit of having more land they just get more wealthy basically hmm seems perfectly fair uh nathan what's your view on this there's there's not much more i would add except for the fact that it wasn't the case for all but often uh this uh freeholding situation is often tied to certain um, uh, roles to do with social order and the military and I'm sure we'll come on to those those points in due course but you already mentioned that there was a minimum requirement that if you had a certain amount of wealth that you would own certain arms and weapons so there's already an indication that these individuals um, though they are freeholders they may have to go off and fight for the king um, so, so I think I think that would be the other aspect I would add, but I don't I don't think it's um it's not like an integral uh, characteristic of the omen, but it was it was a an aspect which was often associated with it. If, uh, it I, would I, that make sense to I, both of you? It became, 
an integral characteristic of them. Mm. But, but it wasn't at first, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, over, over time, there's additional responsibilities that are added on specifically to yeoman. Uh, and so you, you talk about things like um, guarding the uh, residencies and the properties of, uh, of knights and nobles when they're, when they're away uh, campaigning or something. That, that, that's a responsibility that would fall to yeoman. R R Rupert, do you think there was an equivalent to a yeoman in, say, France in the Middle Ages? Unfortunately, I don't know quite as much about uh, French feudalism, um, but if I understand correctly, then a, a Franklin uh, was something was something that's roughly analogous. So a uh, a peasant of some of some kind, like an agrarian, you know, agrarian figure who had uh, distinguished themselves to some degree. I mean, but, probably in an American yeah. context, I, I I could say more because this, this is much later on, of course. But the um, the planters come to uh, take that kind of position. Yeah, well, I, I look, I'm not, I'm not talking about like 18th century Americans, obviously, but um, I, 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 I can't see this. I look, I, I've looked at like um, the French in the medieval period and the Italians and uh, the Germans and the Austrians, um, and there is no kind of equivalent that I can see an English yeoman in those societies. I mean, I may be wrong, but I, I, I can't see them. Yeah, I mean, I, I would find it shocking if there wasn't some kind of equivalent, because it's it's simply a question of what do you do with the the very accomplished um, agrarians? You know, some people some people work harder, work work smarter. Uh, they're just more efficient about what they do, and they, they earn more money and, uh, you know, accrue more assets to themselves. So you can't just pretend that that's on the same status as that that, that person is on the same status as uh, as a slave. It just but makes no sense, especially not for medieval sensibilities. Uh, but Rupert, it doesn't really work. Like when you look at the feudal system, it, it doesn't really work with that system. It doesn't. I'm sorry. Um, and as I tried to explain a bit earlier. Um, in the 1440s, 1450s, the feudal system totally fell apart in the UK, in, in England. It totally fell apart. Uh, it didn't on the continent at all. Um, so, like, to me, there is a big difference here. Um, and to me, and I may be wrong again, um, I think it was because the feudal system never went very deep in England despite William the Bastard's win in 1066, um, it didn't go very deep. So that as soon as the Black Death came along and suddenly there's a huge shortage of labor, etc., um, it just fell apart in England immediately. Whereas, um, because no one really believed in it in the first place. But in the con on the continent, that was not the case. And I know I've had arguments with people about this, um, and and you may agree or not agree, but to me, anyway, I look at it, and um, yeah, I, I think this is like kind of where English exceptionalism comes into play a bit, but, you know, it's just me. Yeah, funnily enough, I think we've had an argument about that in the past, because I, I, don't, I don't agree at all. Um, it's uh, it's very much, to me, warmed over uh, Whig and, and liberal rhetoric, um, sort of uh, you know a few hundred years after it's after it's been relevant. Um, I, look, I I agree with no name here. The the French didn't have small free landholders in the same way that Britain did. I don't think they did. Absolutely, I agree with that. Are, are you saying you think they did, Ruben? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they did. This is this is a phenomenon that occurs all over the place. It's you have to have a pretty robust legal system that just doesn't exist in uh, in most places to uh, to actually stop this from happening. Essentially, okay. Well, all right. Well, look, I'm, I'll agree to disagree on that one. Um, Nathan, what do you think? 
I mean, I, I don't know enough about the time period to say with any confidence either way. Um, but I, I do think that you can trace uh, the yeomanry um, kind of status within um, England back to some forms of Anglo-Saxon uh, social arrangement. And the example that I would give is um, if we look at the uh, Alfred the Great's reorganization of the Feards, who, who are the main uh, individuals who for, form this feud, or, or the core of it, uh, and, and I should say what, what, what he does is, whereas before Saxon kings or nobles had uh, at various times called the army, or, or roused the muster, mustered the army, that's what I'm trying to say, he established a standing force, half of which would uh, be uh, out on campaign, and the other half defending his realm, and those who would make it make up the the defensive force would be free men who owned their own arms. Uh, they wouldn't be uh, serfs or slaves or whatever. It, uh, so, so I, th I think um, we can see there that there's already um, a, pr a pre feudal form of yeomanry, uh, as it were. Uh, these free these freeholders who have their own arms, and this gets carried over into medieval England in a perhaps in a different social structure, but it's still there. Uh, and I think that's probably why it's so embedded within uh, English culture. And to some extent, the, uh, like the, you, you mentioned uh, pre-show Rupert, these 19th century, and, and I think during the show, 19th century uh, histories uh, influencing a lot of how we see them. Uh, see this situation but what they do pick up on is there's a kind of anglo-saxon connection with the yeomanry uh, and this gets fully played out in uh, ivanhoe with robin hood um, but there is that kind of connection there of it not quite fitting in with the norman um norman society or, or it being predating it in some way perhaps antithetical to some of its overreaches so that's so <laughs> so, so, so I think there's some truth on both sides in, in some way because I think the the omen isn't necessarily a a feudal creation, as it were. Yeah, I I don't disagree with anything you say there, no. Um I I I think there is a tendency these days that we'll, we'll look at our. Uh, early historians and and try and claim, oh no, these guys weren't right. But like when you look at some of the modern historians on this stuff, um, they're even less right. Obviously, if you've got any common sense. Um, so I do, yeah, I I do think there was a. I guess this is the pivotal point on this. I think there was a difference between Anglo-Saxon England and France and Germany, Austria, whatever. Um, and I do think that Rupert kind of got that right. You probably won't agree, Rupert, but look, that, that, that's that's my own opinion, you know, anyway. Well, well what do you think, Rupert? Um, could, could you say that last point again? Sorry, I'm a, uh... I, I think there was a basic difference between Anglo-Saxon England and the continent, Germany, France, Austria, whatever. Um, and I do think that it came out earlier in England than it did in other nations because um, there was this there, there wasn't this feudalism and serfdom and what have you in England that you had in the rest of these countries. Now, you can turn around and say, oh, that's liberal thing, blah, 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 blah. I'm not in the least bit liberal, mate, trust me. Um, I, I, I am not. But I do think that England had, shall we say, more... I don't know how many more, but we had more um, 
independent people who own land who were not the the aristocracy uh, i mean yes there were differences but that's partly because there were differences all over the place so i mean as i was as i was saying earlier there are, there are some pretty significant differences between just scotland and england um sure not there were differences about, there were differences by region as to we're sorry? not talking about scholars all right no no fine fine but to, to say that there were differences between the continent and england is almost expect well it, it, it is exactly expected because this was a very uh very much a system that uh, it was just reflective of what the, whatever the situation was on was on the ground. It wasn't it wasn't something that was like top down prescriptive, um, which had a very set structure, and you just apply it to your uh, your society regardless of the circumstances. It's just it's just a case of it, it's it's a purely descriptive arrangement for what you, for you know what happens when you have uh, populations like a you know essentially a warrior aristocracy that. Uh, that needs to that has a lot of land and needs to come to some some kind of some kind of uh, arrangement with a population below them that does not have that much in the in the way of like assets and especially not in terms of like hard currency to, to trade like the distinction between uh, say Villain and and Freeman is like has a lot more to do with who can actually feasibly pay taxes what do they what do they have that they can trade in order to be able to you know benefit from from what else they require that they don't currently have. So they still need they still need things like defense. Um, they still need to be protected. So what what are the, what are they? Yeah, what, like what do they have? They have they have money. Money is always preferable, uh, and so they'll trade money because they would rather that their labor is more valuable. If you're a villain and you don't have that much money, then you trade your your labor. If you don't have any property at all, then you know perhaps you have to become a slave in order to actually be able to survive at all. So th this is a, this is a lot less a lot less prescriptive. So if if this situation was diff was vastly different in England than elsewhere, it would be purely it would be much more just down to material considerations, not you know not not really all that much else. Uh, and the material conditions in France were not all that different to the material conditions in England. Oftentimes, they were actually better. So, what in France? Yeah. Okay. So, how did um, English armies raise these great numbers of bowmen? Do you reckon? Uh, they imposed the they imposed military training as a requirement, and they militarized the economy, the, uh, the society, to a much much greater degree than than was the case in France. That's why the English kings were so so keen to try and keep a hold of their various uh, French possessions through time. Is because the French possessions were worth significantly more in terms of hard currency. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I have no problem with any of that, but. Um... Yeah, okay, so they made every Englishman train every Sunday. Oh, um, uh, another crucial point as well is that uh, the the English, a, a lot of the time, were just, be were just better led. They just had better better commanders, and they just happened to win, win a couple of battles. Well, happened to. You know, they won They won a couple of battles due to uh, you know, superior strategy, superior tactics on the ground, etc. For sure. I, again, I don't argue with that at all. But... How did uh, English kings end up with like going to France with um, ten thousand longbow guys? Say that again, sir. How did English kings end up going to France in the Hundred Years' War with ten thousand longbow guys? I I don't understand the question. They have they have a lot of. Uh... They have a lot of people who are who are trained to do that, so they can just uh, you know sort of pay them to to come along, or even impose impose that duty on them. Uh, especially if they've uh, you know done the ethnogenesis groundwork to to get the uh, the English on board with the uh, you know with the with the idea of standing behind their king who wants to do that. By the same token, France was able to raise you know even even more men to protect themselves. I think I think there's two things here there that that's interesting is one is that um the the emphasis on the longbow in part uh, was to counteract the fact that they had less troops and you can you can see this in various contexts I, I think it was um um Edward the third well Edward the first and then Edward the third really harnessed this in their wars against the Scots because the, and the Scots had really no 
uh, response to it at the Battle of Halladon Hill, for example. Uh, the Scots love this um, Shiltrum formation where they have all these long pikes and and it's really impenetrable. Oh, we'll just drop arrows on them, and they had they didn't have the cavalry to deal with it, so they were absolutely smashed. But when they go to France, you know, the Battle of Agincourt, for example, that's the famous one, I guess, uh, for the English longer longbowmen. Uh, and the Welsh longbowmen, of course. The uh, no, there were no Welsh longbowmen. Um, was, they, was I was told this by someone on AM's channel. There were no Welsh longbowmen, <laughs> <laughs> and the few that there were were mere mercenaries. Oh well, um, we'll discount them then. E uh, even even though half of Wales was like considered part of England in those days. I'm treated exactly the same, but you know. Whatever. Well, all, all all of it by that time, but uh, that's that's uh, another here another. Um, but it but it it helped them win against a much larger force because, of course, the range of the longbow, their power and and um, ability to wound uh, you know infantry was quite substantial. So I, th I think that's one aspect of why why do we see such an emphasis upon the longbow with the yeoman. Why do they take that form of kind of military contribution? Well, tactically, it's really important for the English kings. But the other side of it is, and maybe, you know, we'll get onto it a bit, I guess, Robin Hood. But there's another side in which I believe Edward III would give um, pardons to, to various outlaws if they would serve as longbowmen in his army against the Scots. And so you you start to see a connection there of, okay, this is somebody who's skilled. They've obviously got some kind of uh, military training, often lurking in the woods or whatnot, uh, like a forester. These people can, through their military service, then ascend to a kind of yeoman status. They're, they lose their criminal record. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Right. Uh, we, we know of at least two longbow archers who were knighted in the Hundred Years' War. Hmm. Um, through bravery or skill or whatever, they, they were knighted by the king and they became Sir Harry Smith or whatever it might be. But, uh, and that would never have happened in France. Never. Did Bestowing titles is always a tight is is always a privilege that uh, kings had. Yeah, but, everywhere. but the French would never have done that to like someone equivalent to a longbow archer. They just wouldn't have. Whereas England did at least twice in the Hundred Years' War. No, they did. And, the, the and, France did, and many others, many others, went from being archers to being like armoured men at arms who would fight in the line with knights. Ruka. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I just disagree. This is this is something that happened constantly. Um, it, it, kings were always able to to grant this. Yeah, we're, sure. we're always but always able to grant titles. But they didn't if they were French. Say again. They didn't if they were French. They didn't. I'm sorry. They just didn't. Go and look at the histories. They didn't. Yeah, I just don't agree. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you can not agree, but the point is if you can go and look at examples and it didn't happen, whereas in England it did. Um, partly because the English yeoman was like a landholder. He was not a, a serf or a peasant or one of these people. Uh, he was a bit above that. And the, to me, anyway, that is one of the major reasons why England did advance these people and the French didn't. If you if you can find examples of the French advancing people, go look for it, uh, Rupert. I, I can't find them.
Well, I mean, apart from anything else, the the problem late late on was uh, was that they were granting too many titles, um, not too few. So that's something to bear in mind. What was what what was the problem with that? Uh, that it was um, essentially just uh, destroying the stability of the mores of the nobility, because you letting in too much too many uh, you know nouveau riche or um, you know too many too many people who hadn't been uh, steeped in the traditions of the nobility was uh, was damaging to the the ethics of the members of the nobility. So they had to introduce new laws that basically meant that you had to be a you had to have been a uh, noble, or you had you had, your family had to have been titled for a few generations before you got access to certain positions. So that you couldn't just start dominating the uh, the ethics of the nobility with uh, you know much more like plebeian um, mores and uh, and ethics and such. When did France bring in the idea of the division? between military nobility and um, scum nobility, which like led to the revolution. When did they bring that in? Uh, I, th I think it's basically an, a relatively informal um, division that was uh, more generated in the 17th century when the um, nobility had lost some of their uh, traditional autonomy and uh, and privileges from being out in the provinces. So when uh, they were being more centralized. Only, only in the 17th century they brought away the Zara. They did what, sorry? Only uh, in the... I said only in the 17th century they brought away the Um, yeah, I mean, we managed. I, I, I've not really done the requisite reading to like really dive too much more into this. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was a bit earlier than that, Rupert, to be honest. But all right, um, well, between between the you know nobility of the robe and the yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, th I think it is roughly the 17th century, but we'd have to do a separate uh, a separate stream on that or something. Someone has nice little birds in their background. Yeah, sorry, that's me. No, cool, cool, man. I like it. I'm, I'm, I, I, I have a couple of zebra finches. Um, so yeah, I, I like listening to little birds in the background. But it's yeah, very wholesome, isn't it? It's, it yeah. feels very like you're in an English garden somewhere. Absolutely right. I, I fall the same. I, I absolutely fall the same. Um. But yeah, I, I look. I do think there's 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 this fundamental difference between England and France, uh, which I don't think Rupert agrees with. Where like uh, the small landowning class in UK, this like the guys who who own who only owned a limited amount of land. And maybe worked on it and got their hands dirty. Those guys in the UK were not like chucked away like they were in France as peasants. Um, those guys were yeoman. I, I think that's part of the difference. But whatever you guys think, do tell me. Yeah, I mean, again, if you're if you're if if you own about a hundred acres of land or so before the time of like uh, modern industrial or mo mo well, modern uh, like industrialized agriculture machinery then you're just not going to be able to do that much of that work yourself so uh, I think by that point they're probably going to be more interested in the kind of bureaucratic roles that, that we associate with the later the, with the later period especially but even even before that the, you know the kind of thing that Nathan was, was bringing up earlier in terms of the uh, the roles that they that they were granted by local lords and then eventually by the king um, that ended up being more more of what they were doing, but the important thing is that they were able to maintain themselves much better um, than than others because they already had their own lands that they could potentially even just get rents off. You know, they just uh, claiming rents. Yeah, and obviously a bloke who owned a hundred acres of land could probably take I don't know maybe ten dudes into the king's army. 
inning one. One question uh, I, I had for both of you, because uh, I, I genuinely just don't know this, but one of the things that was mentioned on a, a stream, we were looking at kind of the legends about the origins of um, kind of Britain, the mythology of Albina and so on, was that with Britain kind of exiting the Roman Empire, uh, you know, in the uh, early 400s, you kind of have a difference between... Um, what emerges then on the British Isles compared to the continent in that the Franks essentially take over much of the Roman infrastructure. Uh, and so I was just wondering if there's any, if there, there might be a difference there. I know that's going way back, but if there's a difference from that legacy, which maybe is um, leads to some of these differences that we're kind of uh, touching on here. But, 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 but. Brittany, um, Nathan. Um, Brittany got his name because so many Anglo Romans left the UK to go to to Britain. What's now called Brittany? Um, so yeah, absolutely. I would say actually, there's, they're quite similar, uh, especially in terms of the fact that there have been multiple in in, in the British Isles. There have been multiple. Um, waves of uh, conquerors that set themselves up as a uh, an aristocracy above a, a larger popul population um also essentially subsuming a, a previous one so by and large the uh, aristocracy is made up predominantly but not not entirely which is quite noteworthy if we get into if we get into a topic that i've got in mind later on um about the origins of the the yeoman um predominantly the new wave of uh, invaders so that applies both to the Gaul, uh, both to the not the Gauls, the, um, the Franks ruling over the uh, Romano Gauls, uh, but you know also the Anglo-Saxons to the previous Britons, and then in turn the Normans to the uh, Anglo-Saxons. <clears throat> That's interesting. Yeah, I do find that interesting. Um, I also find it interesting that like people who want to make Britain the same as the continent, like basically hand wave aside everything that makes Britain different from the continent. Do, 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 do you see that at all? If anything, I see quite a lot of attempt to um, draw differences between Britain and the continent out that aren't necessarily there. And it gets a bit ridiculous in, in some places, I would say. So especially, I'm, I'm sure I've brought it up before, but the ideas, the ideas that were talked about um, trying to contrast English, um, uh, the, the English uh, king and the English parliament and the English political system in the era of absolutism, quote unquote. So comparing Britain to France in particular under Louis XIV. Uh, the actual powers that both kings had were well reversed to, to how the propaganda would uh, would would generally have led you to believe, because the um, the Whigs at the time were trying to you know set the, set themselves up as the uh, the kind of benevolent rulers, even though you know in practice the uh, the kings that the Whigs were, were were working under were were actually even more powerful than Louis. It's just that Louis was much better at wielding his powers than um, than any of the English kings of the period. But if you actually Look at and look at what the English kings were capable of and what the what powers they theoretically had. Then, yeah, they, they were they were much more powerful. Yeah, that that's um, an interesting way to look at it. I suppose um, it, it's not one that I agree with, but all right. Um, I'm an English exceptionalist, so obviously I'm not going to agree with that, but. I do see where you're coming from, uh, Rupert. Um, I, I, I just don't understand why some people want to make England the same as the continent when she plainly wasn't. I mean, you know, there were quite substantial differences. Yeah, I mean, I don't think... I, I think some of the differences are, are manifest in terms of what's been 
uh, what's been achieved in a lot of places, but I think it's easy to misattribute what those differences are. So I don't think it's I don't think it's really that much down to the constitutional settlement that we've uh, that we've set up, or or due to some like uh, that, I don't that, know. Mis that's Go almost on. that's all much later than the era we're talking about, isn't it? It is, but some of the historiography about this period does come out of much later. So if you're trying to if you're trying to set up a uh, a kind of like Jeffersonian style republic with uh, you know the, the which, I'm not, which I'm not which I'm not no but this is this is kind of where the where the historiography comes from to a great degree trying to trying to set up this like class of uh, uh, noble peasants um, yeah you see I don't know who that at all I I don't think that's what it's about um, and and to try and change it more to what I believe anyway. Um, let's go back to Robin Hood, all right? Now, Robin Hood was around, uh, according to legend, of course, because he was a, a, a mythical, legendary character. He was around about the time of um, Richard the Lionheart, who beat Saladin several times with his English soldiers. Um, like his knights were mostly Normans, but his English soldiers were mostly English. And, and that's where you get English soldiers showing St. George as their battle cry and all this kind of stuff. Um, and at around that time, this is where the Robin Hood legends start. Now, I know that Nathan, for example, and you, Rupert, have done stuff on the Robin Hood legends. Um, what do you, what, what do you guys think about that? And I'd ask Nathan first because he hasn't spoken for a bit. I think there's just so many angles you can take with Robin Hood because um, the legend is very much influenced by the uh, ideal concept of the yeoman. Uh, let's just take one, one aspect. So the the forester, we I mentioned him earlier, or the woodsman. The forester would have been an individual whose responsibility would be to safeguard the forest of the king or a noble. And that includes um, keeping outlaws out of the forest, because often that would be a place where they could um, reside. They would often uh, prevent like grazing going on there, that's illegal grazing, uh, the cutting down of trees, they would tend the forest as well, uh, and they would dress in typically in green, and they would be very good at with a bow and arrow because they would go and hunt the deer for their lord and so on. Now, these are all features that we can see um, in, to some extent with Robin Hood. He, dre he typically dresses in Lincoln green, and he has a, he's a great archer. He, uh, he and his merry men live in the forest, and, okay, the, they are... On the one hand, they're deemed outlaws, but it, in the way this the kind of legend has developed, he's on the actually he's administering the king's justice in his. Yeah, he's, he's fighting for the king, isn't he? Really? Right, because Prince John has been tyrannizing, taking people's land uh, when you know when they didn't deserve that, taking their property, destroying their livelihoods, and you know in when we get to kind of. Uh, in the Victorian era, Robin Hood himself is a victim of that. So he he is, um, you know, Rupert mentioned that like a, a yeoman might defend his lord's uh, house or estate while the king's off uh, away on campaign or in crusade. Well, this is a good example. Robin Hood is administering the king's justice in the absence of oh, the king. Yeah, yeah. 100, 100. Yeah, I absolutely believe that. And um, he is Richard the Lionheart's number one bloke, really. That, 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 if, if you read the Robin Hood legends, that's what he is. Um, he's not in any way this communist or whatever uh, assorted modern people try and pretend he is. He's not. He's he's a, he's he's the king's man who is trying to support the king's justice while the king is off 
um, defeating Sullivan. Most definitely. It, it's uh, throughout, it's about, you know, I'm doing this to restore the king's law. And when the king returns, it's, you know, straight away serving him and asking for pardon for eating his deer, essentially. And you, you actually get this in one of the earliest um, uh, versions of the story, a guest of Robin Hood uh, or Robin Hood, as it would have been then. Uh, and in this setting, it's King Edward, King Edward III, who we've already mentioned, uh, utilized the yeomanry in his military. Well, he, uh, in disguise, appears at one of Robin Hood's feasts. He's dressed up as a monk. But Robin recognizes him and immediately bows down, gets on one knee, uh, pledges himself to the king and asks for forgiveness for, you know, having to be an outlaw and whatnot. And the king, uh, rather than kind of punishing him, pardons him and takes him into his own retinue. He joins the court as one of his men. And I think that alludes again to what um, Rupert was saying earlier about how the king would kind of work, ally with the yeomanry against the nobility. Well, you can kind of see this dynamic here. So I, th I think you're exactly right that this isn't, Robin Hood is not some kind of uh, um, anti-hierarchical force. If anything, as a yeoman, he's faithfully playing his role in maintaining the social order. Um, yeah, he's, as he's, best the, he can. he's the king's man. Yes. While the king isn't there, um, I, as a child, I remember watching like a TV series on Robin Hood, and there was an episode where um, Richard the Lionheart comes back and meets Robin Hood, and Robin Hood goes down on his knee and he says, "Ah, oh, my king," and all the rest of it, and. Yeah, absolutely. Robin Hood was like administering the king's justice when the king wasn't around. That that's always been my view of Robin Hood. In, think, in that sense, he's actually sort of like bolstering the uh, the hierarchy rather than mm -hmm. uh, trying to subvert it, because he's uh, trying to put various figures back into into their place who have been wrongly uh, removed. So he's kind of trying to. Uh, re-establish the sort of just hierarchy after it's been subverted by people who are who are sort of, sort of like a little bit a little bit more jumped up and in certain tellings um, trying to um, return his own land as well to a to a degree. So he's been yeah. wrongly. No, no, look, or, or you also like there is I, I like Nathan knows much more about this than I do, but th there is this uh, thing in Robin Hood where he is a Saxon lord who has been wrongly displaced. But I, I, I will bow down to whatever Nathan says about that, because I know he's looked into it much more than I have. Well, I mean, um, uh, R Rupert on the stream we did actually on Robin Hood pointed out, you know, there's, there's a historical analogues with uh, figures like Fulk Fitzwarren, who would have been a member of the nobility um but i i think the where that comes in more tends to be in the victorian era as far as i understand it um but the the, the yeoman aspect or the outlaw aspect uh is the original version of the story or in the origin in the earlier stories i should say um it's it's a later development merging that with the nobility um but, I mean, it, it's still consistent, though, because a yeoman would have been propertied. So it's not an Im unimaginable leap to say, OK, yeah. um, he's lost his land at the behest of King John. It, it doesn't matter so much in that regard if he's a yeoman or a, a noble. Um, I guess it does have certain implications, though, about, like, um, well... <laughs> There is a sense in which the yo the ideal yeoman is this kind of faithful servant of his of his liege. He displays various virtues, but a noble can be a knight and can really be the ideal, the paragon, um, which a yeoman. I'm not sure if they can ever reach that in some sense. Um, well, in a couple, terms, a mythologically, couple, a couple of them did. No, um, mm. it's like the king knighted them. So it was possible, but it was very, very difficult. 
yeah yeah um but but, I, but i'm i'm kind of wondering um beyond kind of just the position i mean more like in terms of um i'm, I'm not quite sure how to put it but like the moral um virtues i almost <laughs> I feel like there is a there is a distinction somewhere between the yeoman and the knight, how they how they're configured together. Um, Rupert, do you, I, th- I think you've kind of mentioned this before? Uh, do Do you have anything to kind of add on this? Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things or one of the implications would be if if he was already titled, uh, but it had his uh, title and his properties taken from him, is that there's again been a uh, unjust disruption of the uh, the proper hierarchy, and then uh, it, it's, it's a retrenchment of the hierarchy in that he is uh, he is then able to completely organically demonstrate his uh, his virtue to reascend to his uh, his proper place. Makes sense. That makes sense. Mm. I mean, he, he he's a good enough warrior and um, gentleman to absolutely. All, all the local people would realize that, like, you know, this dude is should still be our lord. Yeah, uh, I, I think that would make sense. I, th- I think maybe that's the the key difference. Actually, is if he if he's a yeoman, then in a sense he is a faithful servant to the hierarchy. Um, whereas if he's a noble, he can be the leader of the hierarchy, um, and and maybe. Uh, like that calls for a slightly different set of qualities, you know, the ideal leader versus the ideal uh, second in command, almost. Um, and and you've kind of alluded to it with Robin Hood is subservient to King Richard. And when I think of King Richard, I I, I have a different sense of uh, character, although they are on the same scale, like. It's not like Robin Hood is not adventurous or courageous or something like that, but it requires a different, a little bit of a different temperament to be uh, King Richard. Do, well, do you see what I, I mean? I, I, I actually think Robin Hood is more admirable than King Richard, but hmm. sorry, the, than King John, I beg your pardon. Um, <laughs> oh, <but> yes, yes. <laughs> King John is not someone I think is a was a good king. So, I mean, when King Richard came home eventually, after like his uh, uh, his uh, bounty was paid, and he eventually made it back to the UK. Um, yeah, Richard the Lionheart was like one of the greatest kings of his era. Absolutely, he was. I mean, he he defeated Saladin many times. So. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, but I also think it's interesting that the greatest uh, mythical English hero of that era was at the same time as Richard the Lionheart was defeating Sullivan many times. I, th- I, I don't think that's coincidental. No, I, I don't think it is either. Um well, in part because you you have that sense of the absence of the king, and so who's holding the realm into account and when it's being subverted in the way King, king John or Prince John does at yes. that point, then it needs somebody to rise up to to kind of re- maintain what can be maintained until the king returns, um, and then that translates into other periods as well. Um, so, so for example, there was there was quite a few Robin Hood myths set in the period um just before henry the second becomes king and that's yeah. the anarchy the anarchy of england where really things had broken down in a very te- terrible way uh so and that, and that would have been in living memory for s- some of those around the time of uh, prince john so it you know it's it's touching on multiple periods within english history and then in the tudor period there's a big resurgence in uh, the stories around Robin Hood, and of course, you've just come out of the the civil war between the House of York and the House of Lancaster. So yeah. there is this constant return to we've been in a period of chaos, of um, things being unjust within the realm, 
and we need to restore hierarchy, reinforce order. And the yeoman is a category which is associated with both of those things, in part because they were the administrators of of justice, or they, you know, they, they often took that role within the local community, but then also because of their connection to the to the monarch, um, almost bypassing the nobility. So I I think um I think it, it is very noticeable that it or notable that it is at that period because it, it kind of brings all these different strands together, uh tied in with the actual history of the yeomanry as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially... sorry, uh, uh, carry on. I, think I was just going to say, especially in the Tudor period, uh, that, that would probably be uh, mm. there. Probably would be that uh, emphasis on the uh, Robin Hood myth, and the probably more so even the the yeoman angle, because it's also very glorifying to the uh, the ideal of the yeoman, which was obviously enjoying a resurgence. You know, the, the people themselves, uh, the the yeoman themselves, were uh, were enjoying a kind of renaissance uh, re, you know rena renaissance of uh, both status and uh, prestige i i feel like we ought to talk about adding core um because in some respects it was kind of like the high watermark of the yemen really i mean would you guys agree with that well, I mean, in terms of uh, social status, especially, then probably the Tudor period was the, uh, the high watermark for the yeomanry. But in terms of them actually having a uh, a very visible, tangible impact uh, on on English history, then yeah, it probably doesn't get much better than Nigerian Court for them. Yeah, look, 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 I think I think the Tudor period high point was like following Agincourt and this stuff. Um, if if you look at, 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 at an English longbow warbow archer in 1415 and his basic equipment that he had to have, or he could not join Henry V's army, could not. He had to have at very least an iron helmet, um, some sort of uh, doublet. You know, like a a, a, a a coat which was thick. Um, you also had to have a sword and a buckler. Buckler was a small shield, which everyone in England used to know how to use back in those days, and a dagger. Um, plus, of course, his his war bow and his arrows. The arrows the king would give him, but nothing else. Um, unless you had that as a minimum, you could not join Henry V's army going across to Harfleur. You just couldn't. And the vast majority of English um, warbow archers, who were mostly yeomen, um, also had a male shirt. The vast majority of them had a male shirt. Um, and many of them had uh, like a coat of plates that they would wear. Um, and not a few had leg armor and all this kind of stuff. These guys were absolutely professional soldiers. Uh, and they were absolutely equipped and capable of fighting hand to hand. Like, they weren't these archers that one sees in movies of, from, like, Shakespeare movie, Shakespeare films. Um, they, they weren't these guys who had no armor whatsoever and all the rest of it. They weren't. Um, and, and it just amazes me that we still think they were, to be honest. Well, for one thing, to... Uh... No, actually, I won't make that point, or maybe a little bit later. Um, if you're paying for all of your own equipment, uh, then keeping yourself alive is uh, probably going to be pretty high on your priority list. So you'll get the best armor that you can realistically afford. 100%. And, and this is especially why a lot of these same guys, um, so not necessarily after uh, after Agincourt, but a bit, bit earlier than that, the, some of the first wave that go over, um, 
in the earlier stages of the Hundred Years' War end up going on to become more like professional soldiers and become sort of gradually better equipped over time is because as they have some success and as they get some money for some some additional money for themselves, then they'll, you know, one of the first thing that, things that they're going to spend it on is a nicer armor, better equipment, and uh, hopefully the means to keep themselves alive much, much better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, they capture some stuff, <clears throat> which obviously they're going to keep, you know. If, if you capture a coat of plates, um, you're going to keep it if you're an archer because, you know, so uh, an enemy archer firing at you isn't going to go through that, likely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the guys who first go over, are, are, if they're successful and if they live, um, they, they, yeah, they're going to they're gonna get more and better armor. And as you rightly say, Rupert, um, as they earn money, they're even going to be able to buy a better armor. And they will, because, like, it's a funny thing with soldiers. None of us want to die. Well, I don't think I don't think they could quite just uh, keep anything they found. I believe the the uh, there, there were limits. Yeah, there yeah. Were the limits. laws the laws and restrictions were uh, were quite quite tight on that because obviously there'd be a lot of money to be made for the uh, the lord that was in charge. So yeah, if you yeah, found yeah. something, then you could keep. I think I believe that you could keep a portion of its value, uh, or po possibly even pay the laws to be able to keep it. To you know, by buying the rest of the proportion that you uh, that you yeah. had had just by getting it first but you know it's the, it's the same logic in uh, in the present day in a certain sense you can't just keep a tank if you can if you uh if you find one uh, look, look the french laws were stricter than the english laws for a start because they were but um if you found a coat of plates or a brigandine as it was sometimes called um an archer could certainly keep that that was not um, like a, a, a pure plate, breastplate. You couldn't keep that. But you could keep a brigandine or a coat of plates if you were an archer. Um, you could keep some of the leg armor if you were an archer. Um, there were other things that you couldn't keep. Like, no archer was allowed to carry a... Um, <clears throat> what do they call these things? Um, you, you couldn't carry a pole axe, for example, as an archer, which was the English knight's preferred weapon. Well, I believe any I believe anybody could have them. It's just there are, there are practical limitations, as in you only have so many arms. No, no, no. As an English archer couldn't have a pole axe. Absolutely, you weren't allowed to have one. What, legally? Yeah, legally. It would be removed from you if you had one. Uh, but you, uh, uh, in the same way that, like, if you got a very good French knight's armor, you couldn't keep most of it. But if, if you got uh, an average Frenchman's armor, which would be a coat of plate, stroke brigandine, um, and a little bit of leg protection, yeah, you could keep that. Absolutely, you could. Um, I've put a couple of links in the private chat to, to uh, paintings from the medieval era depicting these uh, these bowmen because that might be a good illustration for the uh, for the audience because it, it confirms exactly what you're saying about they weren't dressed like uh, you know in these like a peasant they were yeah. in full armor. Yeah, the the the, the, the English longbowmen. In uh, the certainly by 1450, they were professional soldiers um, and were equipped to fight either with bows or hand to hand, like that, that. That's and they were expected to do that. And if you look at guys like um, I'm trying to think this guy's name now, um, the, there's a dude who is like. The leading warbow archer in England today, and like he's he's probably not very tall. He's he's probably like I don't know five foot eleven or something, but he's very very broad, and not the sort of guy you would want to meet in a back alley on a bad evening. If you get what I mean. By the way, Duke, are you able to bring up the uh, the image, especially of the? Uh... 
could try and find it now, mate. The uh, the Battle of Cressy uh, image is quite interesting, for one thing, because it uh, sort of illustrates that the uh, the armor the armor that they're wearing is not um, uniform. Oh so no, you, it wouldn't have been either. It wouldn't have been either. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. Yeah, so you can especially see that some of them are wearing uh, armor on their legs, and and some don't have any. Some some have uh, coats of plates, so you can see from the little studs in the uh, the uh, what's it called tunics, um, whereas others don't. But pretty much all of them seem to have mail underneath. And the, and they all have helmets. Well, yeah. Because you Protecting have to have a helmet because. You know, getting hit on the head generally kills you. Well, not on the French side, actually. Uh, you can see a couple of crossbowmen there that don't actually have uh, metal helmets. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's something you probably want to prioritize. Hundred. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, the, the logic the logic stands for the uh, present day as well. If you're if you're going into battle, then you probably want to be going into battle with the uh, the best armor that you can get. And if you leave a leave a helmet behind, then it's a uh, well. It's a style choice, but one that you might end up paying for. Um, 100. I, I can't disagree with that at all, to be honest. Um, okay, let's put this one up. Or is it this one? No, it's that one. There you go. I think this was your other one, um, Nathan. Oh yeah, this yeah, this is actually of the Battle of Ajnikor from a. Um, well, let me double check. I think it was a, just afterwards uh, that this was. A, it's a miniature, um, and it, as you can see again, they're like in proper armor. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I I think it um, it it, it kind of I I found it quite nice because um, as as we know, like they played a huge role in the battle. Um, I believe there's estimates that Henry's army was primarily made up of uh, longbowmen. Yeah, hugely, hugely. Yeah. So, like, they they did justice to that when they did this painting. Like, it yeah, I, I I totally agree. And this is one of the things that annoys me is that um, if if you look at this stuff um, in like modern fiction or modern Shakespeare plays. They try and pretend that the English archers were these guys who had nothing except, you know, their bows. Um, you couldn't even join the English army if you only had your bow. You had to have a sword. You had to have a buckler, which is a small shield. Um, you had to have an eye and a helmet, and you had to have a dagger. That was the absolute minimum that they would take you, you know? If you didn't have those things, you couldn't join the king's army. And then they would also check that you were actually a good bowman. And, and the modern thing that we have come to from historians um, is that what really happened on a medieval battlefield in 1415 at the time of Ad Agincourt is that most of the English arrows were fired flat and at close range, maybe 300 yards. They weren't fired up into the air because that wasn't going to do you any good with good French armor. They were fired flat. They were fired from 300 yards or less. And they would fire twice as fast as a musketeer in the Napoleonic Wars. And they could easily. And they were aiming for weak points and joints in the French armor. And if you look at, like, Adjunct Corps, there were at least 5,000 British archers, English archers, mostly. Um, and they were firing, at very least, five rounds a minute, five arrows a minute. That's 25,000 arrows in a minute. This is what people don't get. 25,000 arrows in a minute. And in two minutes, 50,000 arrows. 
Um, and they were going to find a lot of weak points and joints in the armor. Well, especially as the the archers were positioned uh, on the flanks. Yeah. Right. So they they were. Yeah, um, some of them were. Yeah. Not all of them, but some of them were. Yeah. Absolutely right. No. So they were hitting into the sides of the French troops coming forward. So. Yeah. Um, and and it should be said, somebody did mention in the chat that the French also had longbowmen. Yes, they did. But I I do think that there was um, the English positioning was very important in how they were able to utilize their longbows. Um, and, and of course they were very, ex you know, they, they'd gained a reputation for a reason, uh, across yes. bit because they were so integral to the English army before this but point. The French Agincourt Corps had two small cavalry contingents who were supposed to try and turn the English flanks and failed totally because you can't really armor a horse. Very difficult. Like the one thing that uh, a, a longbowman can absolutely do at five or six hundred yards is like wound or kill a horse. Very difficult to armor it. And a big moving target. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a big target. Well, depending on the range, because uh, at a certain range, you'd probably rather be aiming at the. Uh... The rider than the horse because uh well the rider's the one that's gonna kill you. No, no, you kill the horse and the rider falls off and even if he just falls off fairly gently, he ain't gonna be feeling good. Have you ever fallen off a horse, um, Rupert? Because I have. <laughs> yeah, um, I might have. Uh not 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 that I remember specifically, but uh, I'd be very surprised if I hadn't. It's, it's, you were so, you were so wounded that you forgot what it was like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I must have knocked my head on the way down. Yeah, exactly. You Like, if you fall off a horse, immediately standing up and trying to kill your enemy, it's not the main thing you think about. You're just, Like, all the wind's been knocked out of you, and you're not feeling too good. And if your horse has, like, been hit, and you fall over... Probably your leg's been trapped under the horse anyway, so you know it's it's, it's not a good plan. Um, but the French had learned by Agincourt. In fact, they probably learned by Poitiers in some respect that like attacking the English on horseback was really moronic. But they they still had these two um, mounted contingents on either flank probably less than 400 guys altogether, but they got nowhere. They, they were completely destroyed. So then the French trudged forward on foot. Um, and the archers, like from 300 yards onwards, just like sent thousands upon thousands of arrows into them. Most of which probably didn't do all that much damage to them, but some of them did. And even if 10% did, um, a lot of Frenchmen were wounded or dead by the time they got to the British lines. And then, of course, they came up to the English men-at-arms, who were the best armoured troops in Europe. And all of the English men-at-arms, as Toby Catwalk, I, I recommend Toby Catwall hugely to all you guys in in the chat and what have you. Um, he's an American dude. <clears throat> he's also a jouster. <laughs> His books on English armor are the best thing there is on it. Um, and the English troops, the English men at arms, were armored specifically to fight on foot, because that's what English armies did. They could fight on horseback, of course they could, but they didn't very often. Um, and they were the best armoured troops in the whole of Europe. Um, hang on, Josephina Herringway in the chat. Um, his name is Toby Capwell. As Mashensky is saying, hang on, I'll put it up on the screen. There you go. That's his name, Josephine. Uh, but yeah, um, 
Yeah, the the English uh, men at arms and knights were the best armored guys in Europe. Um, when the French got to these guys, they just got whacked, basically. <clears throat> and then, of course, the archers, once they had expended all their arrows, um, enveloped the French on both flanks and to the rear and just murdered them. And as I hope I've explained in this stream, um, the, the English archers were absolutely um, equipped to fight on foot, hand to hand, as well as using their bows. And as you said, they would have been really, really strong. Like, uh, these bows oh, yeah. are not yeah. like... I, I think there can often be an impression in the modern day that it, when you pick up one of these modern bows, oh, it's, a, it's reasonably light. No, this would be really heavy. The draw on it requires a lot of strength. And then to aim it precisely uh, after you've just been picking up a... You know, you've just fired it. You've got to pick up another one and fire again. It's a, it's going to be a massive toll on you. So the the absolute... You, you said the how broad this guy was that does it today. Yeah, that's what they would, you know, that's they would have been stout to be able to do this. Very, very strong men who, as I said, you wouldn't want to meet in a back alley at night. Absolutely right. Um, look, we can only go on Mary Rose bows these days because the only surviving bows we have are from the Mary Rose, the ship that sank in Henry VIII's era. But there's no reason to believe that these bows were much bigger than the ones that the English used in the Hundred Years' War. Why would they have been? Um, some of them are up to a 180-pound draw weight. That's, like, huge. Yeah, that puts yeah. things in perspective. <laughs> And also bear in mind the the like kinetic energy that a hundred and eighty weight pound draw weight bow is going to be transferring to this knight, even if it doesn't penetrate his armor, and mostly it won't. Like <clears throat> most of the French armor, the best French armor in fourteen fifteen, it's not going to go for his best breastplate probably not going to go through his helmet unless it hits him on the side of it. Um, but being hit by this stuff continually for, I don't know, the 10 minutes it takes you to, to get to the, the English front line isn't going to make you feel more confident and better. Well, the other point as well is that... Uh... If, if, well, on the French side, the armor is likewise not going to be completely uniform. And so anybody who is in less than top tier armor is really going to suffer. Yep. And we can kind of see a little bit later how that how that goes because, uh, well, actually, no, it's slightly earlier than uh, the Nation Corps. Um, but in the uh, Battle of Shrewsbury, um, there was kind of like a great culling, essentially, um, because, why, um, because longbows were used uh, quite extensively by both sides uh, on, on both sides of the fight. Whoever was in less than pretty much top tier armor of the day um, basically died because the bodkin would just go straight through mail. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Rupert. Yeah, it, 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 it like if, if mail armor, it would destroy and it would even sometimes destroy the bits of mail armor that otherwise well equipped knights had to use to fill in the gaps. Yep, yeah, and uh, if so if you were if you were showing up with a coat of plates, which I think was still reasonably popular at the time, um, yeah. and you had some mail underneath that, then that really wasn't going to help you that much either, because if it finds a gap between the plates, of which there are quite a few, um, and uh, the mail isn't going to help you, especially against a bodkin, then yeah, you might as well just be wearing linen, really. Yeah, I mean, Henry V himself, famously, was hit by an arrow in the face. And um, the only reason he survived was the surgeon made a special thing to withdraw the arrow from his face. 
<clears throat> and apparently one side of his face was much more ugly than the other. And that's why we only have one side of Henry V's face in a painting today. I don't know if you you did knew that. I didn't. That's fascinating. No, yeah, that is that is quite interesting. I know it did become a uh, a general style though, especially a little bit later in Italy. So uh, I seem I just chalked it up to that. But yeah, that would also make sense. Yeah, apparently that's the reason we only have his face on one side. Um, is is because his the other side of his face was messed up. By a by a longbow arrow, <clears throat> which is um, not all that surprising if you think about it. Um, the chap you guys need to look at if you want to look at a uh, English warbow archer is Joe Gibbs. By the way, Joe Gibbs has a very good YouTube channel. Mm. Um, go and check him out. I mean that the way Joe Gibbs looks. He's been doing this since he was like, I, I think, 13 or 40, which is exactly what all these English longbow archers would have done. Uh, these yeoman archers would have done. Um, go and check Joe Gibbs out. Um, he's not the sort of guy you would want to meet in a dark alley if, like, he didn't like you. You know, he's, he's, he's a very solid man. But you you can't draw 160, 170, 180 pound draw weight longbows unless you are. And if you've been doing it for years, you at this besides all the manual labor you might be doing, you are not going to be a weak man. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, famously, it was uh, distorting the um, the skeletons of, uh, of basically everybody who was using them. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, Rupert. Um, I, I've seen um, a couple of documentaries where they looked at like guys who were archers, and like one side of their body was much more powerful than the other side, but like they were absolutely units, you know. You wouldn't want the right side of his body bringing a sword down on your head or something like that, you know? No, definitely not. Definitely not. They would have been too strong for that. And I, I think that, again, lends to the, the idea that the military proficiency or, or skill with weaponry was a key feature of... Uh, for a lot of yeomen, like it would be, it wouldn't be unnatural to associate that with them, uh, and so that's why when you get like Robin Hood, he's not just an archer, he's the best archer, right? He's um, and he's and a, a good swordsman too. He's an excellent swordsman as well. And then those who join his band, uh, so like Little John, he gets to join because he's the only, he's one of the few people who's actually able to be best Robin Hood in combat. And uh, he, he's a great uh, he's a great guy with a quarter staff, which right. is basically a huge lump of wood. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so and and actually in the medieval uh, tale of um, Robin Hood and the Potter, which is kind of an interesting one, um, because the Potter is actually a yeoman, but he's not dressed like a yeoman. And Robin Hood says, "You've got to pay me a penny to pass," and uh, he refuses. Now, he bests Robin Hood in combat, and then Robin Hood's like, well, who are you? And he's like, I'm a yeoman. You should never treat a yeoman like this. It's like, if I'd known you were a yeoman, I would have let you pass. But there is that <laughs> implication. <laughs> but there's an implication that, okay, this guy, how, how could this man beat somebody as good as Robin Hood? Well, he himself was a yeoman. And we could all we could infer then he would be good in, good in a scrap. Yeah, uh, essentially. So I think I think, uh, and I know that uh, there'll be exceptions, right? But the there's a general association here, uh, going back to the medieval era, of um, being good with weapons, being able to handle yourself, and being a yeoman. Yeah, hundred percent. I I totally agree with that, Rupert. What do you think of that? 
I was just thinking it potentially potentially goes back to the point I was making earlier about uh, how if you have a division of all of the uh, sort of uh, like people in uh, in the countryside between uh, that don't have a title that is you know between um, the capable and the less capable or just have a, have them you know sort of naturally sort themselves then mm. yeah the yeoman the yeomen are the ones who that, that are uh, the most capable at you know farming and, and accruing sort of wealth and everything to, them, to themselves and, and productivity and success but uh you know by extension they those capabilities also ex would also probably extend to uh fighting capabilities as well do you, do you do, rupert do you not think that like in france there was this certain fear of the lower classes that didn't exist in england like in in france i get this impression and i might be totally wrong the 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 the, the aristocracy etc were kind of fearful of the lower classes the peasants in france like being good at arms whereas in england that was never really the case no i wouldn't say so specifically um i mean one of the things i would say is that uh, if you can get a professional to do it then you would you would pretty much always rather do that and uh generally speaking if you're if you're taking somebody off the land for them to be a soldier then you're losing it losing a taxpayer to gain, gain somebody who's a net drain on your taxes which is the logic that almost everywhere else in europe used to uh hire mercenary companies but obviously that comes with its own uh, complex set of issues you know so uh, burgundy for example much later is is one of the places that um uh pioneers the like modern professional army um because they gather a, a cadre of permanent mercenaries and it's partly because they're so wealthy and they can afford to do that whereas england was trying to uh field the largest army it possibly could on a small amount of on a comparably small amount of money um but with a very centralized uh legal apparatus that allowed them to uh place obligations on the entire population like being able to uh, you know like having to um train with a longbow for example which is something that just doesn't seem to have existed to the same extent anywhere else yeah exactly but i mean on the other hand as far as i can work out from like reading historically um most englishmen in the hundred years war were not desperately like oh i don't want to join the king's army i mean bear in mind in the uh in the hundred years war there was a peasant revolt both in france and in um and the great yeah, 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 as well. Sure. They had nothing to do with the war, as far as I'm aware. Well, yeah, sure, but um, you know, it's, it's both both countries are facing the same problems. It's just that, yeah. You see, I this is where I would disagree with you, Rupert, because I don't think France and England are the same. Well, no, then they're they're obviously not the same, but um, there's not there's not like a great faith in the. Uh, in the, in the peasantry in in England that didn't exist in France, I would say, they're both in, in that particular regard. They're they're both facing more or less the same problems, but France uh, chooses a slightly different option of uh, relying a little bit more on, on mercenaries to fill in gaps in the in the um, aristocratic Mer sort of warrior class. Mercenaries and the aristocrats, absolutely for France, I agree with that. Um, but I don't see any great appetite for the war in France, whereas. The English were, as far as I can work out from reading the history, most Englishmen were fine. Yeah, I'll go with the King's Army. I mean, well, obviously, partly because it was one way a medieval dude could make money. Absolutely, it was that. What well, that was part of it, but also there was no great reluctance on the English part to do it because the Englishman regarded his king. As, he, as he's king, but also like a man like himself. Whereas I don't think that was the case in France. How so? I, I don't think the French peasantry, like even up to the um, French Revolution, regarded their leaders in the same way as the English did. No, I think it's, I think it's almost exactly the same. Um, Especially when you get in, into uh, questions of um, ethnic differences between the uh, aristocracy and the uh, and the wider population, that's been a, a you know a fairly popular talking point both in France and in and in uh, 
in England. It just so happens that we didn't have a uh, we didn't have a revolution in England to overthrow the uh, the Norman nobility in the same way that uh, France had it, had their um, their Gallic Gallic uprising against the uh, the Frankish invaders. But that that was a justification for the American Revolution, or it was used as rhetoric anyway. Well, all right, I'm I'm not going to agree with that, but I take your point. Um, what do you what 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 do you think about that name? I don't know enough about either situation to really come to a conclusion on uh, uh, how similar the English and the French situation is. I'm afraid. Uh, I, I would. I just don't. I, know. I just don't see the English and the French as the same people at all. I mean, certainly not by like the 18th century, but not even in the 15th century. They're not the same people. No, I mean we're not, we're not the same people, but. Um... I mean, there there are certain there are certain similarities, um, and some of the differences are played up that I don't think are there. Whereas, yeah, there are there are certain similarities that are played down that I think are there. It's it, in in a sense, it's splitting hairs, but I, I think I think they're quite important hairs to split as it happens. I mean, one other thing I did want to say as well, actually, about the um, uh, the issue of being in favour of the war or not. I mean, it really helps that the war was happening on France's land, not in, not on English land. Hundred percent. It's a good thing to be in Ireland. Um, but yeah, no, yeah. 100%. I totally agree. Um, but yeah, no, I look, I, I don't know. I hear this from pro French people all the time, um, and I just don't agree with it. I, I, I just think we were different people, and I think England, partly because we were an island, and had 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 this um, period of different development, shall we say. Um, and partly because the English yeoman was a thing, which I don't think there was an equivalent in France. Uh, like I've asked you a couple of times, um, Rupert, if you think there was, and I haven't heard a convincing answer that there was. Um, I, I don't think there was the French, a real French equivalent to the English yeoman. Um, and I think that's part of the difference. Well, I mean, for one thing, um, feudalism was, well, not, not, not feudalism, rather, but serfdom was uh, abolished uh, earlier in, uh, in France than it was elsewhere. But that's, uh, well, no, not, not elsewhere outright, but earlier than it was in England by about 200 years, by the looks of things. I was having a quick look at it. Not effectively. Sorry? Not effectively, it wasn't. Well, I mean, yeah, they, they, make, a, they make a big show of actually abolishing uh, uh, serfdom in uh, 1789, but you know that's that's just rhetoric. That's, that's no, no, I, I don't care about that. But uh, in effect, serfdom was dead in England from certainly the the 1360s. It was dead. I mean, there were still people in feudal uh, in in uh, you know serf serf type relationships with with various sure. lords. But, it, but sure, there were effectively, but effectively. Feudalism died in England, certainly in the four, in the 1360s at the very latest, it was dead. Now, we're talking about a kind of legal contract, and that legal contract still existed until the 16th century. Yeah, but they, they weren't enforced in England. Yeah, well, they were. Sometimes. Now, people were much more jealously guarding their rights for uh, most of, most of uh, especially this, this period that we're talking about, if they could. Right. You, you and I are going to totally disagree on this because I think by the 1560s, feudalism was pretty much dead in England, um, whereas in France it wasn't at all. This is why the French were still in the early Hundred Years' War raising great armies of peasants who were like useless, basically. Um, but I don't what what. Vi- what do you mean? They 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 were using uh, knights and knights and mercenaries the, the whole time. Yeah, and huge uh, levies of local people too. River. I I'm not sure about that. Well, I am, but you know, all right, we we can agree to this. Agree. I'm not going to argue about it. But yeah, they did. The the French were still raising like loads of peasant levies and all this kind of stuff. Which England was like 
totally over by even the early stages of the Hundred Years War. I mean, the long, the longbow, uh, the enforced longbow practice is a kind of levy. No, I don't think it is. You see, it was just what Englishmen did by law. I mean, it, it was a it was a king's law, absolutely. But why is that worse than playing football? I don't understand. Of I, course, it was. It, of course, it was a king's law. Like none of us here, I hope, are like Democrats. So I'm not a Democrat. Um, if, if that's the king's law, by all means. I mean, I wouldn't be against a modern English king um, if he was base rather than Charles the Third, saying, "All right, every Englishman has to fire a rifle every Sunday." Great, I'm not against that at all. And that would be a kind of, um, you know, mandatory uh, national service no, if you were getting fined for not doing it. No, well, no, I don't agree with that. You see, like, because even even when the English archers had to go out every Sunday and practice archery, which actually was quite popular, by the way, like you know, your your girlfriend would go and watch to see how good a bowman you were. Or your wife would go and see how good a bowman you were. It was popular. Uh, there was nothing bad about it, but that still didn't make you have to join the English army. It just meant you could join the English army because you. Yeah, but you were also fined for not doing it. It's like yeah. uh, people like flat caps became very popular, but the reason that they were there in the first place is because there was a fine or a tax for not for not wearing one. Sure, but what's bad about that? Well, nothing, but it's a, it's it's just a matter of cat categories and clarification. But like the the English the English crown was was wielding quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of power over the uh, over the population. I'm, I I don't quite get what you're getting at because I'm saying we were more militaristically centralized. Well, militarist. and that was that was sure. necessary because because France was more was more wealthy, so they had. Uh, well, other options. They had more people. Let's be honest. That was really what. Well, they had they had more people, and they also had more money and more taxes, so they could uh, they could sort of choose choose to to uh, take other other avenues for how to raise their army. So we were trying to over over leverage a smaller population with uh, a smaller and less um, uh, what's it called uh, smaller and less wealthy population by and large. Did, did they have more money, like when Burgundy and everyone else was fighting against them? Here? Who, France? Yeah. Uh, no, Burgundy was uh, Burgundy was more wealthy by that point, which is why they leaned even more on a professional military. But they didn't. They had large peasant levies. Burgundy? No, no, the French. They had large peasant levies. All the time, all through the Hundred Years' War. France had large peasant levies. I agree to disagree on that. I just don't think they were fielding peasant levies in, say, the Battle of Agincourt, or Cressy, or Poitiers, for that matter. They had some at Agincourt. Um, and in fact, if you look at accounts of Agincourt, you can see where they turn up. And it doesn't do the French a lot of good. But all through the Hundred Years' War, France was having large peasant levies. Who were basically unarmored, untrained, and useless. So, all right, England had this thing that every Sunday you've got to go and practice the parts to your longbow. Um, France didn't have that, but on the other end, they just used you as cannon fodder, whatever they felt like. And, and, uh, and had no regard for them whatsoever. Like the, the French century had no regard for the French century at all. Which is okay, yeah, we'll disagree. Possibly, possibly why you ended up with the French Revolution eventually. Uh, aside from like the American Revolution leading to the French Revolution, which obviously it did. Yeah, no, don't agree at all. Fair enough. Um, Nate, you're false.
I, I'm not sure I want to wade into this dispute, but I, I, I do want to ask a question, which is that um, when we get to the Tudor period, you see men like Thomas Cromwell ascending the social ladder. You know, he, he ends up in the court of Henry VIII, this, this son of a, was he a tanner of some kind? Um, so you do see this kind of fluidity within the Tudor social hierarchy. Um, and I'm wondering, do, do you know if you get the equivalent in the French context during that period? Rupert. So that sorry, ask, ask the question again. I was just I was checking something. Sorry. Oh no problem. I was I was just thinking in the Tudor period, you do see this kind of fluidity within the social hierarchy. So that somebody like Thomas Cromwell, who's from you know reasonably low down in the hierarchy, can end up in the king's court as an advisor. And I was just wondering if you get similar dynamics across in, in the French <coughs> context during the the same time period. Um, I believe you do, um, but for slightly different reasons, and it more so happens a little bit later, to my knowledge. I'm, it's not my best period in uh, in French history. This one. What, what uh, would be the different reasons then? So, so later on, you get the well. Okay, uh, slightly earlier than that, you get the uh, you get many French houses, noble houses, being basically wiped out. So a combination of things happens. The um, the French crown inherits a good chunk of that uh, land and wealth, uh, and some of it then gets reparceled, uh, reparceled out in various places, uh, similar to what happened in the uh, War of the Roses, basically. I, th I think Corps wrote really wiped out quite a lot of the French over the Roses. Yeah. I must, must say, as an Englishman. Um, but yeah, sorry, Bruce, carry And then much later, you get um, people who are. Um, giving some kind of uh, service to the the crown and are granted a, a title on the basis of that or or are just outright buying it because the because the crown needs money and that's under people like um Louis the 14th in particular so what what then is happening in the english context which is a bit different to that then uh, in the english context the nobility are more so just being um sidelined essentially in the in the Tudor period so I'm, I'm talking about either side of the Tudor period so uh -huh. before and after um, in the French case but in the English case the the uh, the yeomen are are simply being patronized as an alternative to the uh, the nobility which is still considered untrustworthy for quite a while and it's not until sort of like the I believe the uh, possibly the late Tudor period that I think they start being brought back in properly. I mean, there are certain loyalists that obviously that are always, that are always kept um, sort of like mm. close. Um, so people who had been re reliable Lancastrians um, and helped and directly helped uh, Henry the Seventh when he actually needed it and when uh, when it wasn't clear who was going to come out on top, rather than you know just fair weather friends. But uh, yeah, by and large, the trend was towards lifting up the yeomanry so that they could uh, perform more duties uh, and thereby com you know completely bypass the uh, the nobility. Well, and of course, they're dependent upon the king's favour in that regard, if they've been given land or whatever. So they're, they're more... Uh, and, and it was the same, actually, with... Um, in Moving a little bit later, but in the Scottish context, when James VI tried to reintroduce bishops, well, they're totally dependent for their position upon the king. So they're going to be absolutely loyal to him in a way that uh, if they have their own independent estates and whatnot, then they have a degree of uh, autonomy from his authority. Yeah, um, but but what what I was going to say, say is just to tie it back in uh, was that I wonder then it, you know the Tudor period you you're you're mentioning that there's a resurgence of the yeomanry, but then there's also this kind of celebration within literature of the yeomanry. I, I think of Shakespeare's portrayal of the Battle of Agincourt with the Henry V. And one of the speeches, I, th I think it's actually a half fleur. Let me see if I can, um, I'll, I'll read it because uh, Henry V is kind of extolling his men to go into battle. And he says, a new good yeoman whose limbs were made in England. Show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base 
that hath not noble luster in your eyes. And then the very famous uh, Crispin's Day speech, he says the following towards the end. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, but he be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And so I just I just wonder whether part of this uh, conversation is we're getting this kind of Tudor celebration of the yeoman who is uplifted by his service to the king. In in this example, he's he's almost ascends to um, like gentleman status through his uh, service at the Battle really, of Agincourt. Yeah, I just wonder if there's a kind of um, there's a there's a there's a Tudor impact here, which is quite important. That's what I'm trying um, to say. No, no, Nathan. Also, I would like to point out that with the increasing importance of the Royal Navy in the Elizabethan era, and of course, you know, Elizabeth was Henry VIII's daughter. Um, in, with the increasing importance of the Royal Navy in the Elizabethan era. Um, even more people who would have been considered yeoman back in the day were the guys who were manning those ships and running those ships. That's interesting. Yeah. Because because does Henry the Eighth establish the first kind of um, stable naval navy? Yeah, I mean, look, we we already talked about the Mary Rose bows. That's from. Mm. Uh, the ape ship so absolutely yeah sure but i mean yeah the um the yeoman would have been at that period would have been kind of the uh the nouveau richie of their of their day so yeah to, um extolling their virtues is probably something that would go down uh go down quite well for future patronage and filling seats and things if you wanted to be incredibly cynical about it but you know it, it was there was also a cultural phenomenon of um of the yeoman being generally quite celebrated and a lot of that, a lot of the traditions that were set up there, well, you know, not traditions at the time, but they've come to us as traditions, essentially. I think most of those um, institutions that are still associated with the royalty are, well, are from that period. Yeah. And, and if you were going to the the, the theater, Shakespeare's Theatre yeah, on South Bank in London, um, many of those people would have been what you would describe as yeoman, I guess. Potentially, but that's but you know when you're getting into um, uh, burgers and uh, and those types in the cities, uh, it, it, that's potentially a, a different kind of person that we're talking about. But yeah, there definitely would be a lot of a lot of yeomen around um, in their capacity as um, advisors and uh, and servants of the of the crown. Um, can I just say to Sonny Jim in the chat, uh, Mary Rose did not sink on her first outing in the solar. Mary Rose was quite an old ship, and she sank later after some uh, modifications, shall we say. But she certainly did not sink on her first outing in the solar sunny gym. So there we go. Um, but yeah, I look, I, 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 I don't know that we've really disagreed on this. Um, I, I, I think I slightly disagree with uh, Rupert. In the, I think the English society in those days was a bit different from French society. Um, I could be wrong about it, but I think we were a bit different. Um, but in general terms, I think we've mostly all agreed on what we've been talking about. Well, actually, one of the one of the most substantive differences uh, was talked about by uh, Michael K, nineteenth C fan presumably 19th century fan, uh, in the chat, uh, talking about the uh, distinctions between the various sort of like uh, regional bodies and the, the way that the country was set up uh, administratively, which is a rabbit hole all its own, basically. But, um, you know, they had they had all sorts of uh, customs, uh, customs and, uh, and duties and whatever that were internal to the country, whereas uh, England much earlier was a was, was like a single polity essentially so it had one parliament 
it was basically one uh, customs unit, I believe. And there wasn't necessarily that much subdivision between different uh, between different regions, whereas places like Bret uh, Brittany versus uh, Anjou or Normandy had had quite vastly different uh, legal structures. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. Mate. Um, yeah, um, I yes, I I think that's probably true. What do you think, um, Nathan? I I was going to just add a, a couple of more modern examples where the characters are probably not um, strictly speaking yeoman. But I think they're clearly um, inspired by the archetype of the yeoman. Uh, and one of these would be Richard Sharp from the TV show Sharp. Um, yep. he, he himself is, you know, he's uh, the son of a prostitute. So he wouldn't, and he, he's not landed in any respect. So he wouldn't count in that regard. But he is excellent with a rifle. He, he ascends the ranks pretty quickly due to his merit. He's wearing the green of the chosen men, and I think that's quite important as a kind of a subliminal reference to the Forester or Robin Hood and so on. He um, and it's, uh, he's pretty roguish in some regards, so you could see that outlaw aspect being in there. But he, he's, he's, he's a terrible simp, though. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. Like honor of women, that's something we didn't really touch on. But in the uh, some of the Robin Hood. Uh, Kind of legends, the yeomanry, like the knight, is supposed to serve like and honor women. They're not to abuse them or take advantage of them or something like that. Marry and etc. Exactly, exactly. And Sharp definitely has that characteristic there because he, you know, he's a pretty brutal guy. But when it comes to women, as you say, he's he's a he's a simp. Yeah. Um, the 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 other one would be, and I, I'm a bit torn on this, so maybe you guys will could have a view. I'm unsure whether you could say either F Frodo or Sam would be the yeoman in that relationship. Um, my my inkling is Sam because he's like the kind of faithful servant um, to Frodo, but he's not compelled, right? He's doing it freely. Of and uh, I, I I think the king starts off as a yeoman and mm. then advances. Like we're, we're, when he's the what what's what's he called? Um, an explorer or whatever it is, I can't remember that. A ranger. But a ranger, yeah. yeah I think yeah. he's a ranger, then he's a he's a yeoman, but he gradually advances to where he should really be as the king. Yes, and you can see that connection with Robin Hood again that while he's a ranger, he's trying to restore or maintain order in a world which has been turned upside down by the forces yeah. of evil. Uh, yeah. So you could see that connection. And then with the Shire itself, Tolkien did talk about the some kind of noble families, but it is a very free holding base society. Like it's it's um, there's no serfs in the Shire. Let's put it that way. Right. There's no slavery that and the um, it's all very uh, self-organized. So the, there is a sense in which you could see it as a kind of uh, quasi uh, yeoman society um, but, but by 1066 there was almost no thraldom in england hmm. it would, it, it, because of christianity mainly it, it had almost totally died out there were there 10 percent 10 percent of the uh population listed in the doomsday book were slaves according to uh william the bastard yeah well, yeah, but he didn't actually have that much time to really change anything. He wasn't just going to suddenly no, be... No, no, no. I'm just saying that's what William the Bastard's people said. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you, when you get into all kinds of serfs, then you're talking, you're, you're looking at more like 72% uh, of the of your population. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go with that, River. I'm sorry. I just don't think it's true. Of England, okay, well, that's, uh, what, that's what the Doomsday Book says. Yeah, I, again, I'm I don't care what William the Bastard's um, uh, menials said to him, to be honest. I mean, how many Englishmen went to Byzantium 
and joined the Vangarian Guard quite a lot. So much, so many that like the Vangarian Guard became more Anglo-Saxon than it did Danish or or Norse. Yeah, sure, but but in terms of like the total population of uh, England, it's not that much. No, no. What what I'm trying to say is, when you read something like the Doomsday Book, all right, the Doomsday Book was written for William the Bastard, um, and I'm pretty sure it was like absolutely made to suit William the Bastard, you know, <laughs> because you wouldn't have written a book for him that um, didn't sue him. So I, I very much doubt that that's really an accurate representation of, like, English people in 1066, except how William wanted to see it. And I'm not a William fan, obviously. But, you know, I, I like Richard Lionel. I think he was a good kid, but... Um, your antipathy to William the, the Bastard has certainly come across. <laughs> yeah, but, but I wanted it to, um, because I feel it. Um, but I, I just don't feel like you can rely on... I, 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 it's all we've got, all right? The Doomsday Book is all we've got. But I, I don't think for a minute you should really look at that and say, oh, yeah, this is what England was like. Rather, you should look at it and say, this is what England was like as William the Bastard wanted it to look like. Again, agree to disagree. I can't really... Uh, I mean, if, yeah, if you're saying the Doomsday Book is propaganda, then... Well, all, all books are propaganda to some extent, uh, Rupert, as you well know. Um, but, yeah, uh, you, yeah I, I, I'm sorry. I'm not a fan of William the Bastard, so... I've had this argument many, many times before. You know, the Norman French rescued the poor Anglo-Saxon English somehow or other. Um, I don't hold it. And if um, Harold had not had to race north, defeat the Norse invaders in the north, and then race south again, and lose half his troops in the way, um, the Battle of Hastings would have been very different, and I don't think the Normans would have won. Despite their horses. But that's just me. Yeah, I must admit, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily have too much more to add. No worries, no worries. Um, all right, anything you would like to shill, gentlemen? Rupert, anything you would like to shill? Uh, well, I, I suppose on behalf of both of us, actually, um, we both, we, uh, both Nathan and I were uh, named as finalists for Scott Mannion's um, video essay uh, competition. So, um, yeah, I think both of those should be released at some point soon. Excellent. Go and have a look at that. Scott Mannion has an excellent channel. Do go and check that out, guys. Um, Rupert and Nathan, both great content creators. Um, anything else, Rupert? No, I think that's pretty much it, other than, uh, I guess, my Twitter. All right, go and check out Rupert August's Twitter. I'm not on Twitter, but go and, go and do it. Um, Nathan, you, I know, are going to take a hiatus soon, but is there anything you'd like to um, show? Well, first, let, let me just say thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, I've learned a lot about the yeoman, and uh, I've enjoyed chatting to you both. Um, in, ter in terms of shilling, um, some some folks uh, will know that uh, last week I did Richard Wagner Day, which was, a, I guess it was 13, 14 hours worth of uh, videos and streams on was, the life and works really of good. Richard Wagner. Yeah, really. I'm, I'm glad you thought so, because... Uh, it's um, it's not a topic that loads of people know lots about, but I, I hope that we manage to make it uh, accessible and engaging and, and informative. And uh, you know, because he was just a, an amazing, 
amazing composer. And uh, so people could check that out on my YouTube channel. And then I've got a couple of kind of uh, streams that I had promised to do before I before I go on hiatus. So they'll be up uh, one this Sunday with Ferro. And then with Rupert at the end of the month, there'll be one on King Arthur. Uh, so people can look forward to that. Cool. As well. I look forward to that one, man. That'll be good. Um, yeah, great stuff. Um, like I said, Nathan's going to take a high AS, and I would like everyone in the chat to tell Nathan not to make his high AS too long. Because um, <laughs> the, there are not enough really good uh, English and British channels like Nathan. Um, same goes for Rupert, by the way. Great dude as well. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like everyone to um, tell Nathan, don't make your high airs too long, too long. Hopefully, you'll find himself a really cute girl soon and then come back. So that'd be cool. <laughs> I promise I'm not just looking for a girlfriend. Don't worry. Don't worry, folks. Every young man should be looking for a woman. Sorry, we 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 need the breathing apart from anything else. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, you, uh, don't. But you you've not mentioned your own channel, which is which is also contributing so much to the you know to English culture. Uh, my my, my channel is just my channel. You know, it's just like me doing my stuff. Um, this, I thought, was a really good stream because um, mm -hmm. it was like a bit out of, par partly it was historical, but also I think partly it was about legend and myth, uh, which I think are equally important to a nation, to actual historical truth. Um, and the, the English yeoman to England, I think is kind of central to the English story. Um, as you just said, Rupert, uh, sorry, Nathan, as you said, um, like the king could rely on occasion on his yeoman more than he could his, 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 uh, uh, aristocracy. And so long as he could rely on his yeoman, his aristocracy to some degree could go and get stuff. Um, and that was different about England to every other country in the world. Uh, and I'm sure that some people, and possibly Rupert even, might say, oh, yeah, that's English liberalism. I don't think it was, because I don't think the English Yeomen were very liberal at all, to be honest. I just no, no, my, my, my point is not that they were liberal. I'm, my point is that there's a certain view of them that, uh, that comes from liberalism in the same way that you might say that there's a certain view of uh, Robin Hood that is very socialist. Yeah. Oh, obviously right. it'd be obviously it'd be anachronistic to say that uh, Robin Hood himself was uh, would, would be viewing himself in socialist or non-socialist terms, but there's a, there's a certain way of looking at him. Yeah, no, I ab absolutely right. Bruce, but I totally agree with that. Um, and Robin Hood was not socialist. He, he, what Robin Hood was doing was trying to keep the King's peace and like the king's law w would you not say that was right nathan i agree 100 percent agree yeah, and yeah. he wasn't socialist he was trying to keep the king's law going while the king was away being the Shah saladin in the holy land i i think as well maybe and maybe this is a a point for the present in that we we live in a situation where effectively the monarch is absent in the United Kingdom, and uh, most of us, I can't I can't speak for everybody, but most of us would not be uh, of the aristocracy, and perhaps then the yeoman is and and embodied in Robin Hood, but more broadly is what we can aspire to, and that yeah. that is you know um, maintaining and restoring order as best we can until the king returns that i think i think that's partly why robin hood appeals um so strongly today and i've heard more and more people talking about him today um in this in this period because we we feel that pull and perhaps that is that's a model that we can think about for our own lives in our current and 
the current an anarcho tyranny, as people will call it, we can th we can think, okay, how can I be that yeoman? Or maybe no, I. In some sense, my forefathers were of the yeomanry potentially. Can I be of that today? Yeah, I mean, uh, Prince John was nowhere near as bad as Rishi Sunak. So, yeah, I can't disagree with you at all. Um, yeah, Nathan, well said. Well said. Um, I totally agree with that. Hmm. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure how we do it these days, given, you know, when we talk about centralized states, um, we talk about centralized states in the medieval era, but today, you know, um, we can get in trouble for saying stuff on the air. For oh, yes. So, yeah, but absolutely. Um, Prince John was like no near as bad as Ricky Shunek. So I totally agree with you. Maybe during my hiatus, I will go like my namesake, Robin Hood, into the forest and form a band of men. Uh, of course, on Minecraft. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be the beginning. Yeah, yeah. In Minecraft. In Minecraft. <laughs> Rupert, any final thoughts, mate? I don't think I could top what, uh, what Nathan just said. Yeah, it's. Um... Very interesting archetype, and uh, yeah, in terms of trying to adhere to the um, the Robin Hood principle, um, yeah, the uh, the king is indeed away, so we need to try to preserve his peace and, uh, and and see justice done as best we can in his stead, and hopefully there'll be some kind of um, some kind of validation down the line, but I yeah, can't necessarily be expected or promised. So, for until then, do what we, we must do what we must. Yeah, I agree. I just point out to people in the um, who are watching this, Rupert's um, avatar and name is Rupert of the Ryan, who was one of the best cavalry commanders of King Charles I in the English Civil War. Um, all right, I'm going to play us out with you in there. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captive's need. To wait in heavy harness, on flooded folk and wild. Your new gods all and peoples have devil and that child. Take up the white man's burden in patience to abide. To veil the threats of terror and check the show of pride. My hope and speech is simple. White man's burden for savage wars of peace. Fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. And when your goal is nearest, the end for others sought. What stuff that he didn't fall on thee bring all your hopes to God. Take up the white man's burden, no tawdry rule of kings, but toil a surf and sweeper, the tale of common things. The ports ye shall not enter, the roads ye shall not tread. Go make them with your living and mark them with your dead. Take up the white
white man's burden and sleep his soul's reward. The blame of foes ye better, the haze of foes ye guard. The cry of foes ye human are slowly towards the night. Why brought ye us from bondage, our loved Egyptian God? Take up the white man's burden, ye dare not stoop to this, nor call too loud on freedom to cloak your weariness. By all ye cry or whisper, by all ye leave or do, the silent, silent people shall wail of God and you. The white man's burden have done with childish days. The lightly prophet laurel, the easy young God's praise. The vow to search on my own through all of thankless years. The words with dear bought with the judgment of your peace. Take off the white man's burden through all the anger's ears. All right, that was obviously the brilliant Chris Gard. Do go and subscribe to his channel. Thank you very much to my excellent guests, Rupert August and Nathan C.J. Hood, for joining us this evening. And I will see you guys, um, hopefully, um, tomorrow for Splendid Isolation number 100 and whatever it is. So I'll check you then. Go all, guys, and thank you again to my guests.